Welcome to Gulf Coast Life. I'm Amy Tardif. 820 Floridians could die from melanoma in 2015. It's the most lethal form of skin cancer. A recent study cited by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says 6,000 cases of melanoma are estimated to be related to indoor tanning in the U.S. each year. We'll take a look now at one group of people who is seeing a dramatic rise in the number of these cases. Jessica Cosden of Fort Myers was a 22-year-old senior at Florida Atlantic University in 2006. She was a Middle Eastern Studies major. She worked part-time at a health food store, and she tanned. It was a rigorous curriculum, so I studied a lot, and I used the tanning bed a lot. I, um, the year before that, I really used it a lot. There was a tanning salon right across the street from the dorms in the college, so a lot of kids um, from my school used the tanning beds, even though we were 10 minutes away from a beach. That spring, a cold brought Cosden to the college clinic, where the nurse saw a spot on her ear. She referred Cosden to a dermatologist, who also found a spot on her shoulder. Both were melanoma, requiring surgery. I missed graduation, and of course the first thing I thought was, um, did I do this by using tanning beds? And of course, I don't know. I don't think there's any way to say for sure, but no one else in my family has ever had skin cancer. Um, so that's just the link that I made. And of course, I felt guilty. The National Cancer Institute says melanoma among white women ages 15 to 39 doubled from 1980 to 2004. Nearly one out of every three women that age visits indoor tanning salons each year. In her Naples office, dermatologist Dr. Catherine Russell examines a patient who has had many Hello. problematic moles removed. Like Russell says microscope. most of her patients with melanoma are in their upper the 60s, but her practice is seeing a change in that demographic. I have patients in their 20s and 30s who have metastatic melanoma. Some of them, you know, had a mole that changed and they just waited. She warns people who have more than 50 moles. All right, everything looks good family history of skin cancer, and fair skin to cover up and stay away from tanning beds. Particularly the incidence of melanoma rising is on the trunk of young women, and that is thought to be directly correlated to tanning beds. And if you have a lot of sun exposure, it also increases your melanoma risk. The International Agency for Research on Cancer recently found the risk of melanoma increased 75 percent when people started using tanning beds before they turned 30. Almost every state regulates indoor tanning for minors. Florida requires parental permission. So in the 2015 legislative session, Hollywood Democratic State Senator Eleanor Sobel tried to ban minors from using tanning beds. But she could not find a House sponsor for her bill. I believe with the passage of this bill, we will save many, many lives of young women and young men who believe that indoor tanning is healthy or will help them look better when I know they could use sprays or makeup to get that glow that they want. The senator, whose husband is a dermatologist and has her own line of skincare products, is looking for a house sponsor for the 2016 session. She says she believes she's battling a strong tanning industry lobby. A Journal of the American Medical Association dermatology study found in 2012, the Florida Department of Health licensed more than 1,200 indoor tanning facilities. Representing the industry is Joe Levy, the scientific advisor for the American Sun Tanning Association. He acknowledges the World Health Organization and a U.S. government report dating as far back as 1997 say ultraviolet light from sunbeds causes cancer. But he says the definition of a carcinogen isn't clear. Being a carcinogen doesn't mean that a substance or exposure circumstance is carcinogenic in its intended dose. So what it's saying is overexposure may be carcinogenic, but that doesn't mean that any exposure is carcinogenic. And that on that list, there's only one item that humans need in order to live, and that's UV exposure. Levy, a journalist by trade, says he uses tanning salons about 30 times a year. He says the association's rules say people who will only burn should not be allowed to use tanning beds. 
He says there are also other rules that make the industry more responsible than it gets credit for. There is more money made telling people to stay out of the sun and to avoid it than there will ever be made by uh, interests such as indoor tanning facilities who want people to get it in a moderate and responsible way. There is a balance in the message and telling people to wear sunscreen 365-24 is something that has health effects too. In fact, the Environmental Working Group and other toxicology experts believe some sunscreen ingredients like oxybenzone and retinal palmitate may cause skin cancer themselves. But Ava Kaplan still slathers sunscreen on daily. The Naples resident was 19 when she went to the dermatologist for one thing, and the doctor found something else on her shoulder. A week later, the doctor called and said, this is malignant melanoma, and we need to operate. Kaplan had never been to a tanning salon, but she had been to the beach, often. I wanted to have a suntan, and I'm a redhead with a suntan really is nothing more than a burn, and so that's what would happen maybe week after week. She says it changed her attitude as doctors monitored her for about 15 years. I think 19-year-olds don't need the, like a smack of reality like that. Like what a strange thing to have that's on the surface of your body that, that, can, that can kill you so quickly and so horribly. And, and you could have prevented it maybe too, which really, like really upsets you too. Naples dermatologist Dr. Katherine Russell says melanoma can be fatal, but if you catch it early, chances are you will be okay. And our numbers of even how we're treating melanoma have improved drastically just in the last 15, 20 years. We have many new medications to help even if you have an advanced melanoma, but if you catch the melanoma early, it's almost curable. I say almost curable, but it's very, very good, the results. It's when people wait and let them go that it turns into a much bigger problem. She says, look for the A, B, C, D, E, and U of a mole. Asymmetric or irregular border. Strange color, like pink, black, or blue. A diameter greater than six millimeters. Is it evolving or changing? Or is it the ugly duckling mole, the one that looks different from all of the rest? And if you really want some color, Dr. Russell suggests a spray tan. It's common to see dolphins come up to a tour boat and jump in its wake. But there's a growing campaign that wants eco tours to keep their distance. 18 of these tours are certified dolphin smart across the country. As WGCU's Jessica Mazaros reports, the program's mission is to prevent boats from interrupting the natural behavior of wild dolphins. A couple of safety announcements before we get underway. Underneath all of your seats are the adult life jackets. Adult jackets are for anybody. J.R. Trepper is captain of Banana Bay Tour Company that departs from Cape Coral. On a weekday afternoon, the skies are clear and the boat is carrying about 30 tourists. Trepper maneuvers out of the area's canals, headed towards the Caloosahatchee River. He's on the lookout for bottlenose dolphins. We're part of the Dolphin Smart program so we can have a better impact on our dolphins. His tour is certified Dolphin Smart by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The word smart is actually an acronym. Stay 50 yards away, move away cautiously, always put your engine in neutral when dolphins are near, refrain from touching or feeding, and teach others to be dolphin smart. Cheryl Bonis is with NOAA. She says the goal of this voluntary program is to prevent illegal harassment under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, so anytime you change their behavior, that could potentially be harassment. Some tours use their vessels to create wakes in the water. This attracts dolphins to jump in and ride behind them. It's kind of like surfing for dolphins, but Bonis says wake riding has potential risks. Anything from separating a mother and calf pair, um, interfering with their rest, uh, interfering with their feeding, so that you want to make sure they're getting enough, have enough energy and have enough food. There's a total of 12 certified dolphin tours along the state's west coast and the Florida Keys, only three in Lee County. But there are no statistics right now proving the program has made any difference since it started in 2007. Regardless, Captain J.R. Trepper of Banana Bay Tours participates in yearly dolphin smart trainings. It's where he gets updated safety information. Trepper spots another local tour boat approaching a pod of dolphins. Looks like 12 dolphins out there right now. 
Another thing you should never do is block the path of the dolphins. Never put your boat directly in front of them, and you're seeing that right now, by the way. Trepper says blocking the dolphins alters their course and they dive down. So you have two mamas and two calves right there. All right, here's a boat that looks like they're making a wake for the dolphins, so you can see what's happening here. And that's, yeah, that's not good for the dolphins. But not every tour operator feels this way. It may well be dangerous for them. Uh, personally, I think they're just having some fun. Harry Julian owns Pure Florida, an eco tour he operates out of Fort Myers and Naples. Julian says he hasn't been approached by Dolphin Smart yet, but he's done his research. Um, does it need for everyone to have it? I don't think so. He says it's a good program, but if every vessel stops when dolphins get close, he says it could be dangerous for boaters. We operate in narrow congested waterways. Lots of other boats, lots of dolphins, and you know, if we act different from anyone else there, we're going to be putting our boats and customers in a position of, you know, maybe having a collision or something with another vessel because, you know, not everyone abides by the same rules with regards to the dolphins. Julian says he does not want to sign up for something that he couldn't absolutely abide by, but he says he relies on dolphins for his business and he respects them. We don't feed them. We don't bang on the side of the boat. We don't try and run them over or anything like that. The dolphins frequently come to us. You know, they like playing in the wake. He says it's a partnership with the dolphins, but for Banana Bay Captain Trepper, his partnership with the dolphins includes Dolphin Smart. In my heart, I understand that I am doing the best possible dolphin uh, viewing that I can and not impeding the dolphins. Trepper says he volunteers for the program because he wants to show his customers how dolphins fish, socialize, travel, and rest naturally. Fort Myers has 10 junkyards within the city. Some residents say they're eyesores, placed in predominantly minority neighborhoods. In the past, the city council took steps to limit or ban them, but now one junkyard wants to expand. WGCU's Topher Four has reports that sparked a conversation about race and rules. This is one of the many junkyards in Fort Myers. It's in a neighborhood next door to homes in an elementary school. Community activist and former president of Lee County's NAACP branch, Willie Green, says this junkyard has been here for about 50 years. It's one of 10 junkyards in predominantly minority districts or wards in the city. We have more than 100 acres of junkyard located in Ward 1 two, and three. And that's where most of the people who look like me live. Green says he spent decades fighting junkyards in the city. So I fought for the last 20 or so years trying to eliminate them. And in fact, we thought we had won the battle. We got an audience put on the book back some 12 or 13 years ago that says there uh, be no more new junkyards. An ordinance banning new junkyards and banning the current ones from expanding passed in 2002. But a junkyard and recycling center in an industrial zone now hopes to expand, and it says it has every right to. That decision will be left to the Fort Myers City Council. The right thing is to live up to the original idea of stop it here. Because if they open the gate, it's not just going to be guard freak, it's the other nine is going to come out and we're going to be back where we start. So I believe that the city council is made up of just people that will do the right thing and let no be no. When the ordinance was passed, it was as simple as no means no. But since then, the law has become much more complicated. Garden Street Iron and Metal wants to expand by more than half to a total of 35 acres. President Robert Weber opened the company in the late 80s. Garden Street was among the six annexed into the city in the mid-2000s after the junkyard ordinance was adopted. The city was taking in a lot of the Dunbar community and stuff like that where uh, you know, there's not a lot of uh, tax revenue generated because uh, you know, the, the value of the homes really just don't generate a lot of uh, value. So uh, I guess the county offered up, uh, you know, we, we were thrown on the, the sword to compensate the city for taking, uh, taking in. So the whole industrial complex uh, got annexed into the city as well. The city gave Garden Street and the other junkyards the right to expand when it was annexed. Weber believes they were given those rights because the annexation was involuntary. Opponents worry if Garden Street is allowed to expand, it'll set a precedent allowing the other annexed junkyards to do the same. But Weber says the process for getting any expansion, called Plan Unit Development, or PUD, is decided on a case-by-case -case basis. The PUD process is very clear 
uh, a very appropriate way for city council to be able to take each individual case and determine what happens with that, that PUD application. The city attorney shall read a statement at the beginning of the quasi-judicial During June 2015, the city council meets about Garden Street Iron and Metals expansion. The council hears about environmental impacts, the expansion's proximity to residents, and about the legality of the project. The public also speaks at the hearings on both sides of the issue. You can approve Mr. Weber's application, and that should be the first step in setting high standards for the conduct of businesses like his and allowing them to prosper. This is passed. It's a clear picture of the poor being exploited and the rich not taking care of the poor. The city attorney advises the council to vote on the merits of the project and not how it relates to any ordinances. Fort Myers Mayor Randy Henderson says this project will benefit the look of the city because of its design, which includes simple high walls. I know we have rules. And these rules are not clear to us at times. But what, what I can get my feeble mind around is that we have an applicant who is willing to participate with us to create a better curb appeal. One by one, they vote. Yay or nay. Yay. Mr. Flanders. Nay without prejudice. A yay. 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 Nay without prejudice. That's a, a five, uh, Madam Clerk, that's five yays and two nays. The measure passes. Uh, for this evening and I have one After the meeting, Weber says the expansion could force the competition to clean up their businesses. Like said, the status quo wasn't working. So, you know, to allow me to go forward and, and start fixing up, you know, or make the changes on our property and our expansion, I think it'll give the uh, other dealers the incentive to either A, clean up or B, disappear. Days later, Green says the next step is court. He would like to file a civil rights suit. If we can prove that the city knowingly did one thing for one group of his citizens and another for his other. I don't think I have a hard time proving that. I don't see a junkyard in Ward 5. I don't see a junkyard in 4. I don't see one in 6. That's where the majority live. Where the minority live, 1, 2, and 3, and they all have junkyards. I think I can prove that in federal court. There are other lawsuits regarding the expansion's approval already working their way through the courts. They're on behalf of former city council members challenging the city's decision. The current city council is considering imposing a moratorium on allowing new junkyards or current ones to expand to give it time to fix its policies. As for Green, he's working on a ballot petition that would require voter approval for junkyards or recycling centers. Green says uh, he's still fighting. Fight, and I will fight until hell freeze over. I mean, the fight won't don't end because you want around. I go back, train some more. So many people are raising bees in Florida, the state's bucking a national trend when it comes to the number of managed beehives. While colony collapse disorder, parasites, pesticides, and other threats plague bee populations around the world, the State Department of Agriculture says the number of managed bee colonies here has increased 145% in the last eight years. WGCU's John Davis takes a closer look at why Florida has emerged as an anomaly. Cape Coral web designer Jason Polsky loves his girls, well, 120,000 of them or more. You do your best, you know, in this time and age to provide your girls the very best of everything you can get because they're a part of your family. They're an extended part of your family, basically. His two hive boxes sit on a vacant lot next to his house that becomes a thriving community garden for them to pollinate in the winter growing season. The U.S. Department of Agriculture says the number of managed bee colonies nationwide has decreased from 5 million in the 1940s to about 2.5 million today. In Florida, the commercial beekeeping industry maintains the lion's share of beehives, but the growing number of backyard beekeepers like Polsky are largely responsible for increases in the number of managed hives. Polsky says for him, beekeeping was a natural fit. My wife and I were at the market uh, over here in Cape Coral and she said, Jay, you know, you do gardening, you do all kinds of exotic food stuff. She goes, what if we got bees? 
I'm like, really? She goes, yeah, friends of mine have bees. They love them. And like, they sell their honey. So the business guy in me goes, sell your honey. And so my wife and I got a set of bees from a gentleman, and we started that way. Polsky works with commercial beekeeper and bee removal specialist Keith Council. What we want to do here, because you're wanting to produce more honey, right? we're actually going to take this box that we've just started working in, move it down underneath this box. Right. That'll force them to work that more, and they'll start pulling evenly. Polsky says council took him under his wing. He says, Jason, you are a bee haver right now. And that's kind of like the beginning stage of beekeeping. And then he said, well, I got to a certain stage where I've been able to work my bees a little better. And he says, now you're getting into beekeeping. Council is a former president of the Florida State Beekeepers Association, an owner of Council Farms in Cape Coral. He specializes in live bee removal. When a hive moves into the walls of someone's home or into a hollowed out tree trunk in their yard or some other place where they could be a nuisance. Sometimes we go to people's properties and they want to keep the bees themselves but have no idea how to do it. And you can't just take a box and set it there and tell the bees to move into it. It doesn't work that way. So I physically move them into the box for them and get them started. Give them a little bit of smoke to each one. Council doesn't know exactly how many backyard beekeepers he's helped get started, but he says the number is in the hundreds. Interest in backyard beekeeping also got a boost in 2012 when a state law dissolved local government prohibitions on beekeeping. Council says another reason for Florida's increase in beekeeping could be the advantage of the state's year-round warm weather. But on the commercial side of Florida's $13 million a year honey industry, Council says the state's dramatic increase in the number of managed bee colonies could paint a misleadingly rosy picture. It's harder for a commercial beekeeper to make a living at this than what it was 10 years ago. Uh, we have more issues with pesticides, fungicides, different viruses, or parasites are just, I mean, it, it costs us a lot to keep them alive and keep them going. Where in a backyard setting, you have the same issues, but at a smaller scale, doing pretty good there. Yep. So where the nectar is. Council estimates this past spring alone, he lost about 600 hives. The bees he removes from people's homes and relocates to standard bee boxes help offset those losses, but he worries about the financial practicality of beekeeping in the future. Well, we're looking at a 70% loss in our bees every year. It's not a viable industry at that point. If we go over that, they start collapsing. I mean, beekeepers, commercial guys are actually today going out of business because they just, they don't make enough money off from it. The price of uh, wholesale honey is not enough to cover the fuel costs and all the other expenses we have in doing it. In announcing Florida's increase in managed bee colonies, the State Department of Agriculture credits voluntary partnerships between beekeepers and growers. Such programs helped serve as a model for the 2015 Federal Honey Bee and Pollinator Strategy. Council says close relationships with growers are essential. The farmers are our best ally back and forth. Uh, if we don't have friends in the farming community, I mean, we are farmers. But if we don't have friends in the pollination we don't know what they're applying to the fields, so we can't protect our bees. So it's a very tight-knit group between the farms and us. Get a little bit in each one, let them all know we're here. When it comes to mitigating colony collapse, council says he thinks a lot could be done, but at the end of the day, it comes down to funding. Florida lawmakers approved a $2.5 million bee research center in 2015 at the University of Florida in Gainesville, aimed at researching cures for threats to beehives but Governor Rick Scott vetoed that funding for the second year in a row. Council says a stable and healthy bee population is essential, not just to the honey industry, but to Florida's $120 billion agriculture industry. The River of Grass Greenway, or ROGG, is a proposed 75-mile bike path that would connect Naples to Miami. The Miami-Dade County Parks and Recreation Department is heading up the project with other partners. The county believes the bike path will expand local tourism and get more people out into nature. But those opposed to the project say it will encroach on Florida's Everglades. Protesters walked along the proposed path from Collier County to Miami-Dade County in 2015 over the course of five days. WGCU's Jessica Mazaros reports.
It's the fifth and last day of the ROGG protest walk. About 30 people are marching on the shoulder of Tamiami Trail toward Mikasuki Resort and Casino. Samuel Tommy is a Seminole tribe member and ROGG protester. He says the bike path cannot happen. Tommy says there has already been too much damage to the Everglades. It's part of my religion to leave the earth and to take care of the earth, protect the earth for the future generations. The environment has totally changed. There used to be a lot more wildlife here. There used to be a lot more birds everywhere. Some protesters are concerned this project could open the door to more development in the Everglades. Like Brian Doyle, he lives in Naples and has participated in the protest walk all five days. Any impact at all affects us all. And I would love to make sure that we do our best to remediate situations we've destroyed and hopefully put a halt to anything else that comes up in the future. But it would be good for business, says Mark Heinicke of Miami-Dade County Parks and Rec, who is also the ROGG project manager. He says the trail would be paved asphalt 12 to 14 feet wide, running parallel to US-41. Heinicke says 90 percent of the project will be built on government-owned land. He says the bike path would bring more tourists to businesses along the way. There could be a huge benefit in terms of getting people to appreciate the environment more. If you travel down the road 60 miles an hour in your vehicle, chances are you're not gonna really appreciate the nature as much as you could if you were to walk or ride your bike here at a slower pace. You can soak things in. He says he doesn't necessarily agree with the ROGG protesters, but he respects their opinion. Nothing has been decided, nothing has been determined yet, and it may not be for a very long time. Heineke says organizers are still working on the feasibility study and master plan. An environmental study would be next. Heineke says this is all theoretical. Even if it does happen, it could take years. Thanks for watching Gulf Coast Life. I'm Amy Tardiff. For the latest news from around Florida, visit WGCUNews.org. Have a great day.